Hi, and welcome to our coverage of what circuits entry to the chip kit design challenge. So, the chip kit design challenge is a challenge run by uh, Design Spark, which is part of RS, as well as the Elector and Circuit Seller magazines. And so, what we're doing, uh, this, the competition is basically building an eco friendly and or, efficient, or very efficient circuits. It's all to do with uh, renewable energy and green technologies, that sort of thing and anything involving the chip kit development board. So we've covered the chip kit development board before. We love using it here. So what we thought we'd do, we thought we'd do an entry and what we thought we'd build, we decided to build a maximum power point tracking circuit. Maximum power point trackers enable us to get the maximum power transfer available from renewable energy sources such as thermoelectric generators, inductive power transfer systems and some photovoltaic panels. They do this in using the theory of superposition, which is an impedance matching method. So what we do, let's take a basic electrical model. So this box inside this dotted line here, this actually represents electrically some form of renewable energy source. So for example, photovoltaic cell, all of these things. What we have, we have an ideal voltage source, but then in series with it, we have a resistance. And this is actually inherent in the energy source itself. And this resistance causes us to lose power. What we want to do, we want to deliver this power, in this case, into a boost circuit. And we want the input resistance to this boost circuit to get as much power as possible. So we want to get the most power out of there. And to do that, we have to make those, those two impedances equal. Our boost circuit then takes the power drops in this resistor turns it into another voltage source with some form of source impedance and drives it into some form of external load. Which can be something like a laptop or an uninterruptible power supply. All of these kind of, these things. Sort of things. So what our circuit does is this voltage can vary, this load can vary, and it will automatically allow for both of those and get the most possible power all the way through all the transformations. Right, so first of all, let's actually explain what a boost converter is, and apologies to those of you who already are you know, familiar with uh, switch mode power supplies, but what we'll do, well first of all, just run through a generic boost converter, show you roughly what it's doing. So we have a circuit diagram up here on the board, and this is a bog standard boost converter just with sort of the uh, absolute generic components drawn in. As you'll recognise over here on the left, this is our source. So in this case, it's our source of renewable energy. So like your thermoelectric generator, your inductive power transfer system, exactly. photovoltaic Any of those. Panels, Electrically, they're all going to look the same. So we take the power that comes out here and we filter it. So we have a capacitor. You'll see why we need to filter it later. We've got an inductor in series here. So an inductor, if you haven't really sort of used them much before, the main function of inductor, to put it slightly in non, well, non-mathematical explanation anyway, is it resists the rate the uh, the current changing. So if a current is flowing, it tries to keep the current flowing. If the current isn't flowing, it tries to keep the current not flowing. Down here we've got a switch. So we've drawn this in just a normal switch. In the actual circuit, we use a FET. Um, generally, you'll either use you know, either a standard BJT or a FET, any kind of transistor. IGBTs are very popular for this kind of thing. We've got a diode here, so it only conducts in one direction. Then we've got another capacitor here which filters our output. And this is directly across our load. So this is just any resistance, any kind of load at all. Right, so what we're going to look at, we're going to look at this in two states. First of all, let's turn the switch on. So this is state one. So I've completely removed the diode. No current will flow through the diode. And as we've turned our switch on, we have a short circuit through here. What happens? We start to get power flowing through our source, through the inductor, through this and back to the source again. The capacitor also charges up. So what we've now got, we've now got current flowing through the inductor, a nice lot of voltage across the capacitor, but nothing actually getting through to our load. So let's take it into state two. Let's turn off our switch. So this goes open circuit, and suddenly at this point our diode starts conducting. This inductor 
wants the current to carry on flowing. So this now pushes the current through here and out to the load, which also charges up this capacitor. So the current flow is now across through here and through the load. So we've got an increased voltage coming out and being de delivered to the load. So we can control this voltage and we've also increased the voltage. This is what's called continuous conduction mode. And this is the norm mode for uh, boost converters. The alternative is discontinuous conduction mode. Now, for discontinuous conduction mode, what happens is our third state, and now what happens is that the MOSFET, or your switch, sorry, and your diode are both open circuit. This means that the capacitor provides the total voltage to supply the load until it fully discharges. And we can see that down in our graphs here that we've got continuous conduction mode where we've got our on state as it, the voltage rises and then as it starts to as it gets the switch turns off your voltage starts to decrease back down to zero and then it continues to do that. Now in discontinuous conduction mode down below here we have our first state where we where the switch is on and the second state where the switch is off and then we have our third state where both the switches are off and the inductor is at zero and it's waiting for the switch to be turned back on and it stays off here at zero. So at this point no power is actually being drawn from the source at all and all the power is being supplied just by this output capacitor here. So our circuit actually varies from the generic boost converter in a couple of major ways. What we do, we measure the input voltage and you see the input voltage comes down here and comes into our chip kit. We also measure the output voltage, which again comes down here and comes into our chip kit. Now the chip kit does some computation with these, does some calculation, and throws out a signal here. Now this signal here actually controls the, well in this case it's MOSFET, but generically it's the switch. And what it does, we actually change the amount of time the switch spends on to the amount of time the switch spends off. So we change the amount of time it spends in state 1 to the amount of time it spends in state 2. Now that changes the voltage um, characteristics of the output, it changes the way we draw current from the input. And the actual effect of this, when you use the algorithm that we've uh, developed, we perform the impedance matching right from the input, right the way to the output. So that actually performs our entire impedance matching circuit. Now there's a range of other research currently going on in this area. Um, some of the methods include using voltage sensors and current sensors, especially on the input, to find maximum power transfer. And there's other methods that are current sensorless. But the way that we're doing it is novel, because we've got a wide range of loads that can be applied here, which also allows for output voltage variation due to the output capacitor, rather than having a battery which requires a fixed voltage. Uh, we're also allowing for a range of input voltages to be applied. Uh, we're also using a chip kit max at E2 in order to perform the digital closed loop control, which sends a pulse width modulation signal, as I said before, to the switch. And we're also using the actual boost converter itself in discontinuous mode because it, it works better as a form of control and we're also not using any current sensors whatsoever, only voltage sensors. So this actually makes the circuit a lot better, particularly when you're looking at actually um, getting into productionization issues, so design for manufacture, all of that. Now the big thing is that our circuit costs around £50 or so, something like that. Take a typical current sensor, that's going to cost you anywhere between 15 up to £100, say. And the low end, that's going to be low accuracy, that's going to be a low frequency response, all of that. And there's temperature drift. Exactly, all of these factors. Instead, what we can do, we can do voltage measurement on both of these. And in current sensors, well, actually, I talk about the uh, price there. That's talking about one particular class of current sensors. That's talking about Hall effect based current sensors. Now, the advantage of these is they have very little effect on the circuit. There's another class of current sensors which basically involves putting what's called a shunt resistor in either the positive or negative supply. So in here, we can either put a resistor in here or a resistor in here. Now there's low problems with this. I'm going to start, if you put a resistor in the path here, you're going to get a voltage developed across it. This is inefficient and that voltage drops are going to change as the current flowing through the circuit changes. 
and that cre creates what we call ground bounce that can cause a whole lot of issues. If you put it in the top side of the circuit, we have to measure the voltage across it. That means you're either putting a specialised integrated circuit to read that voltage across, uh, and you've got issues with having to do what's called high side measurements, so you've got issues with common mode rejection ratio, altering your signal, that's going to decrease the accuracy. So the way we've done it, using only voltage sensors, is far superior, we believe. Yeah, exactly. So at the heart of the actual software that runs on the chip kit, what we do, we take the V in and the V out, and what we want to do, we want to run from through an equation, this equation here. Now we've actually derived this equation from the uh, equations of the discontinuous current mode boost converter. So we plug it in, and out of this comes our duty cycle. Now, what happens is the output voltage and input voltage that are fed into the chip kit are then used to fed into a lookup table that's stored on the chip kit to find the correct that predetermined value of the duty ratio, which then can get sent to the switch. Now this is a faster way of calculate rather than trying to calculate the duty ratio in real time. Now the advantage of having it faster, this means we can actually respond to um, dynamically changing loads or dynamically changing voltages much quicker. So if your load is changing at a certain rate, this means the chip kit can keep up with it. It's all done in the lookup table, it's all really quick. So let's actually have a look at the performance. Let's, let's go head across the lab area. Yeah. In order to demonstrate the circuit working, David is going to vary the supply voltage via the power supply, and what we should aim to see is that the input voltage to the converter is exactly half of the supply voltage as we cycle through a range of values. Now, the channel 1, which will be the yellow waveform, which is the supply voltage, is 5 volts per division, and channel 2, which is the input voltage, which is going to be the blue waveform, is at 2.5 volts per division. So we should see those two waveforms just exactly track one another. OK. And here we go. And he's lowering the supply voltage down, and as we can see, the input voltage is tracking it exactly half. And now raising the supply voltage up, and it's still tracking exactly half. And that's fantastic. Okay, so this is our main board. So this is the bit that actually has the boost converter on it. And we've done this out in the design spark. So just working from left to right, let's run through the components we've got on here. We've got this component here. So this is actually a resistor, although it looks a bit unusual. The reason it looks a bit odd is it's a very high power resistor, but it's also a thin film construction resistor, not a wire round as you typically see. And the reason we did this is because it's a very low inductance resistor. And this means it just doesn't affect our results in the same way. Now what this resistor does, this actually simulates the internal resistance of uh, some form of renewable energy source. So this is the internal resistance of a photovoltaic cell or a um, thermoelectric generator. Now doing this means it generates quite a lot of heat. And as you can see, we've actually got it mounted on a heat sink here. And it has to be mounted on a heat sink, otherwise this thing's going to overheat. And just to monitor it, we've actually got a crocodile clip and we actually just clipped a thermocouple to here just to keep an eye on it. Moving over along we've got a capacitor on here so this is the one that we actually saw on the generic boost converter and this one actually filters the input uh, voltage supply. And this is where we've got probes hooked up to monitor the input voltage to the converter. Moving along we've actually next we've got an inductor here so this is actually a wire wrapped around a ferrite core inside here and this I believe is a uh, 10 microhenry inductor. Moving along, this one here, so this is our diode. Now we've used a Schottky diode for this one. The reason being this actually has a lower what's called forward voltage drop than a normal diode. Basically means you dissipate less power in the this diode, which means we get higher efficiency. And also means we can get away with a smaller heat sink. You can just see the heat sink we've clipped on round here. And also running very efficiently, we've got a uh, MOSFET in here. So that's acting as our switch. And again, we've got a very small uh, heat sink attached to there. Now, we need to actually drive this MOSFET with quite a specialised voltage, much higher than chip kit can provide. So we've actually got a dedicated MOSFET driver chip in here. So actually, actually handles all the MOSFET driving. 
and this is driven by an optocoupler which we'll show you on the next board and all the control outputs come out through this connector moving around, the very large component we've got here this is our output filter capacitor so we picked a fairly large one but in a real circuit we can actually even go larger than this and that allows the uh, us to stay in the discontinuous mode in stage 3 for longer so when we're actually drawing no power at all from the supply and then we're, with a bigger budget we'd hope to use a super capacitor in, this, in its place the power output comes, you can't see it, but just at the top here and then we drive it into our big power wire wound resistors and that allows, allow us to uh, change the load very easily and means we can just prove the circuit works with a wide range of loads and we've done that, all those results are written up in the report so if you want any more detail do have a look at that on the uh, DesignSpark site going across to the next board we've got a piece of Vero board here so just for playing around we've implemented this on a bit of error board and what we're going to do, we're going to, and going to implement this as a shield for the chip kit uh, development system so it's quite it's a lot uh, simpler than it looks actually what you've got on here currently we're using some resistors here to scale down the voltage in and voltage out so that it's suitable to be read onto the chip kit but these voltages are quite noisy so we also filter these using some capacitors then the chip kit has to drive the MOSFET so what we've got here, we've got what's called an optocoupler so the chip kit drives an LED that LED drives a phototransistor that phototransistor drives a logic gate and that logic gate drives a MOSFET driver chip now what this does is it provides isolation between the actual chip kit and our circuit because obviously we don't want any interference or anything getting fed back and over here on the other side, you can actually see what we're playing around with is playing around with using operational amplifiers to actually increase the accuracy of our circuit compared to the simple resistor dividers. And we think we're actually going to get a useful boost in efficiency out of doing it like this. But uh, we shall see. If, it's, if it works, it'll be in the final report as long as we've got time. Moving down again, we've got the chip kit and we've got display. Display isn't quite hooked up yet, but it's almost ready to go, just getting the code written and this display is actually going to show us the current values which the chip kit is operating with, so it's going to tell us the V in, the V out and the efficiency that's going to be rather nice and then you can't see it in here but the chip kit is also hooked up to a laptop and that allows us to actually look at the values it's using allows us to do all the debugging using the external serial monitor so we can keep an eye on all the values in real time We've managed to build this prototype for around under £50 and with mass production we'd be able to further reduce this cost. And the values that we're getting out for performance and efficiency are comparable with other existing solutions. The fact we've been using the chip kit has enabled us to actually build this really, really quickly. And the fact, you know, the code, we can use the existing libraries that are out there. You know, even things like the really simple function like and log out, we just don't have to write uh, PWM code. Absolutely fantastic. Um, we haven't shown you it today, but we're working on putting an uh, LCD display on there as well. And it also gives us the flexibility. What we'd like to do later if we get time is actually add temperature and irradiance sensors on. Uh, irradiance being uh, light intensities like an LDR, something like that. And that will actually enable us to uh, work really efficiently with photovoltaic panels. Just absolutely incredible performance we're getting out of a very cheap circuit. Um, yeah, so hope you've enjoyed watching it. And please leave us any comments on our Design Spark page and take a look at our full report that you can find there. So, bye for now. Bye.